think outside the box, if you will. I mean, go there, go off campus. Let's think this through. And sure enough, that's where the Mustang was born. When it finally hit, it took the country by storm. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Cars in Context. I'm your host, John Clore. You know, uh, on this show, we bring the world of the automobiles into the context of our everyday lives. And we've got a very special show for you today. And our guest today is going to be someone who's going to give us Automotive 101, taking us under the hood of our cars to give us some basic knowledge about how to keep our cars maintained properly. And that guest is Joe Babby. As Joe, welcome to Cars in Context, my friend. Hi, John. Good to see you oh, again. We're going to have a great time out there, and people are going to be able to learn a lot on this show. So I know that's going to be an important thing. But before we get out there, Joe, let's find out what's in the news. All right. Well, the question we have on our minds today is who's going to relaunch the small truck market in America? You know, folks, after Ford ended production of their Ford Ranger, really was the only real true compact truck in America. It ended last December. Everybody's been asking us well, about when, there, when is there going to be a replacement for this Ranger that we like so much? And now that's just down to Toyota and Nissan, whose entries in the compact segment are kind of oversized. So the question is, which one? Well, we've done a little bit of research for you, and even though folks are looking at uh, maybe a replacement for this truck uh, based on a car, remember the, Joe, remember the old El Dorado? Uh, El Camino. El Camino. El Camino. And what was the Fords? It was a Ranchero, remember? Mm -hmm. sure. Well, Honda's uh, truck is called the Ringeline. That's based on the Accord. So some people think that this, this new Ranger is going to be based on a car. But actually, that's not going to happen. The number one and two people that are looking at lo this market is basically Hyundai and Volkswagen. They're looking at the real true compact truck market to come in and while this void is in the market for the domestics come in and jump in and take some of our lunch I know General Motors is coming out with a new compact Colorado the question is how compact is it going to be right and also General Motors does have a, a, a version of an El Camino yep but it's in Australia they've decided not to bring it over to America yeah. and did it's, it's a really cool looking uh, yeah they're cool and did it for Ford who's got one in Australia as well mm -hmm. it's, it's the uh, Falcon Ute so uh, bottom line is folks are telling us here at Cars and Context, if you give me a new Ford Ranger with a four-cylinder turbo diesel or an EcoBoost, they'd buy it in a heartbeat. So, oh, well, what do you got, Joe? Do you have any, any ones for I us? I do, I do. Um, uh, is GM facing bankruptcy? Oh, a God. recent Forbes story by contributor Lewis Woodall mm -hmm. uh, caused a stir with the headline, General Motors is heading for bankruptcy again. The reporter cited General Motors' return to losing market share stated that the next Chevy Malibu will be the worst entry in the most profitable D segment, claiming that GM seems unable to develop products that are competitive in the U.S. market, and pointed to the German leadership of, uh, and engineering of VW as the world's automotive role model. Wow. The Fed's own 500 million shares of General Motors, or about 26% of the company today, and yes, it would need to get the $53 a share right. to break even on its investments. Uh, but the Germans and Japanese had famously underestimated American manufacturing once before. Yeah. And with Woodall's own tagline being, I apply unconventional logic to economic issues, <laughs> we'd prefer to stick with a more conventional logic to help us chart GM's economic future. Yeah, I'm tired of these guys that uh, I was looking at market share. You know, market share went down right after the Japanese automakers came back online after the tsunami. Joe, that's a, I mean, everybody lost market share when they got their, their production back. So saying that that's a reason why he's thinking they're, they're doomed again is just wrong. And I don't know about you guys, but, uh, you know, the, the investment we've made, the, the recovery, as tenuous as it is right now, is kind of predicated on us selling cars. And if we weren't selling cars, what, the economy wouldn't be working right. at all. And we are selling cars. The big three are selling very, very well. And on GM was up 10% this yeah. month. I'm sure Ford and Chrysler were too. So it depends on where you get your automotive news. Make sure you Absolutely. get it here on Cars in Context and not from Forbes. Um, speaking of magazines and car magazines, Consumer Reports was in the news recently because they lost its champion. By that I mean, uh, for those of you who still trust Consumer Reports, you know, uh, I'm not sure if you heard the news that Nissan had hired away their chief car tester, a guy named David Champion, who had been their number one critic of all the domestic makes for, for years and years and years. And he's the supposed unbiased automotive expert that's been on there. You know, I've never been a big fan of Consumer Reports methodology. Nor have I. Yeah, I don't, but um, this guy now is working for Nissan. He's going to test their cars. And for me, you know, um, 
I just it shows that this old um, this this whole car business that there's there's old alliance, uh, alliances that are going on Joe in the background that are much harder to drop than than the consumers losing their alliances for their favorite cars. So you really got to be careful where you get your car news and. Between you, me and the lamppost, I never bought into any of the stuff that Consumer Reports are saying. I never did either. And, you know, I would just say go out to your, you know, whatever car you're looking for, go to your retailer, drive the car, um, look online. There's a lot of blogs by owners who will yep. tell you the truth. They're, they're, that's, the, that's the real Chris Sawyer's truth. blog, thevirtualdriver.com, and uh, yeah, or, or watch Cars in Context. You got, you, know, all about it. you got another one for us. I do. Uh, new trade deal with Japan to cost jobs in America. A new study from the Center of Automotive Research says that allowing Japan in the pending Trans-Pacific Partnership Free Trade Agreement will cost the U.S. auto industry thousands of jobs. According to the Detroit News, production in the U.S. would fall by over 65,000 units because it would be cheaper for the Japanese automakers to build vehicles in Japan and export them to the U.S. since the import tariff would be eliminated. Oh, exports, from, uh, exports from Japan would increase over 100,000 units. And the study shows that 2,600 direct auto manufacturing yeah. jobs would be lost and an estimated 9,000 supplier jobs and another 14,900 auto-related jobs would be eliminated. Domestic automakers did, don't want Japan to be in the talks arguing they don't open their home market to the American vehicles. <laughs> So what else is new? I mean, I mean, yeah. We've never been able to get into the Japanese market. Yeah, you, you know, if day. you saw the, the footage from the tsunami of the cars being washed ashore, you didn't see one single American car. So, yeah, that's we'll definitely watch that one, Joe, for sure. And uh, on a lighter note, uh, Ford has announced that it's uh, launching its reborn luxury brand in China. And while you may have heard that Lincoln was going to be, you know, uh, resurrected in the United States as a new brand with new products and a whole new lineup. Now the Ford executives are doing a U-turn and they're going to actually launch it in China right now. And I, you know, if I for one, I can't see how that would hurt Lincoln because uh, the right now in China, luxury brands, especially American brands, are really hot. So the plan is to have Lincolns in the showrooms in China by maybe the second half of 2014. Maybe they'll have some of the new products by then. But really, to me, I don't think it's a bad idea, Joe. I think it's a great idea. Competition is good. Cadillac sells very well there, so Cadillac will have a little competition, but that's okay. You'll see a, a revamped Lincoln lineup uh, coming out a little bit later than that, and we're going to be watching it closely here on Cars and Contact. All we can say is, rats are rock rinking out there in China. Have a good time. <laughs> so that about does it for the news. Now, uh, for today's topic, uh, let's go outside and get under the hood with Car Care 101 and Joe Babias. Welcome back to Cars in Context. I'm your host, John Clore. And for the topic of the day, we've got Joe Babby as Joe. Hi, thanks for joining us. I know you guys have seen Joe's work on AutomotiveTraveler.com. Here's an auto journalist that really knows his stuff. And Joe, today, I want to basically take everybody under the hood of the car. What the heck are we looking at? Let's get some basic car knowledge. So when you walk into your, uh, your local oil change place, you know exactly what they're talking about. So Joe, why don't you just take us through a little basic Car Care 101, Joe Babby as style. Sounds great, John. Yes, I'd like to I'd like to talk about doing a regular vehicle inspection uh, that anybody can do. You don't need any technical uh, expertise. Uh, the owner's manual will help guide you through it. And uh, let's get started. John, okay. Why don't you open up the hood? All right, that's going to be a tough one. First of all, you look for the little lever that's got the hood on it. Yeah, and then uh, all all cars are designed today with a secondary hood latch, so it might be a little difficult for people that aren't used to getting onto the hood. Uh, to, uh, to open it and find the latch, I just recommend you look at the owner's manual and it'll tell you how to do it. So there we, we go. just open the secondary latch and now we have the, the hoods open. Don't forget not all hoods have their own strut. Sometimes you'll have a prop rod, so make sure you look for that as well. Generally the prop rods are along the side or the front of the engine compartment. Absolutely, absolutely. But again, the owner's manual will tell you how to open your hood and how to keep it propped up safely. So with your general maintenance, you want to check a, a few of your fluids. The fluids you want to check on a regular basis is your engine oil, your uh, transmission fluid, your brake fluid, your engine coolant, your washer fluid, and your power steering fluid. And with engine oil, they recommend you, che you check that at every fill-up uh, and the rest of the uh, fluids perhaps every month just do an inspection in your driveway. We'll get started first with, by checking your engine oil. Uh, go to your owner's manual <laughs> and your owner's manual will show you where all the locations are of all of the components that you need to check. The engine oil dipstick today and in all today's cars has a yellow handle to it. Pretty and much very, usually it'll stick out like a sore thumb. It really does. <laughs> it's right there. You just take a, a paper towel or a cloth and you pull up on the uh, dipstick. You wipe it dry and before you put it in, 
you want to take a look at the bulb on the end and there will be some hash marks that will say minimum and maximum oil level. And Joe, we might point out that some manufacturers don't have a wire style dipstick, they have a flat metal rod which will have embossed on the side safe levels on it as well. That, that's so, true, they're all a little bit different but again okay, the owner's manual will t show you uh, how to read your particular dipstick. Right, and now that it's clean? Now that it's clean, you put it back into the dipstick tube, bring all, it down, all, the way, all down. the way down, and bring it back up and read your fluid level. In this case, the fluid is, is topped off and there's appropriate uh, amount of fluid in there. So you just push this down, put it back in nice yep. and tight. If your car does need some oil, it's very easy to add oil yourself. There's a cap at the top of the motor. In this case, you take this off and add your oil. It's very important to use the correct oil. This, in this case, this yeah. car uses 5W30 uh, weight, if, weight oil. As if you have a modern car, most modern cars do. But always, again, check your owner's manual. And uh, sometimes you'll need a funnel. The best way to get that in there as well. If it's not uh, loaded on the cap, that's the best way to look for it. Yep. And, and it, you know, if, uh, if you're not used to buying oil, you can go to your, uh, the, any of the local auto stores, tell them the type, or bring, them, bring in your owner's manual. Yeah. They'll be happy to get oil and uh, give you actually a paper uh, funnel to help put the oil in there, so keep it topped off. And we might also important. we want to point out that the oil is not all created equal. You certainly want a brand name. Some of the oils that are not tested, they're they're imported from China or they're not tested for uh, government standards. Get a good brand name oil. Don't don't chance on it. Uh, I totally well, what agree. else we got to look at then, Joe? We check well, the oil. After your oil, you normally go to your transmission fluid. Uh, however, on this car, a four-cylinder <laughs> Malibu, you can't check your transmission fluid. On many cars, you can. Uh, with this Malibu, the only thing that has to be done at, is at 100,000 miles, the fluid has to be changed. Uh, but other than that, you, there's nothing to inspect. There's no fluid levels to check. It's a sealed unit. It's a, it's a sealed unit. On my car, I do have a dipstick, and that's easily uh, checked uh, at idle, mm -hmm. basically. And if this were a V6 uh, Malibu, you would have a dipstick right. in your transmission. Four cylinders, doesn't ha they don't have it. See a couple other fluid levels here, Joe? Yeah, th this next one here, uh, this, is, uh, this is for your brake fluid. This is your brake fluid reservoir. Uh, on the reservoir, it's an opaque reservoir in color and it has uh, two hash lines, a minimum and a maximum line. Uh, as long as your fluid is between those lines, you're good. If it's a little bit low, yeah. you certainly want to add it. And in this case, it tells you to add DOT-3 mm -hmm. uh, fluid, which is a specific type of brake fluid that you can get at any of your parts stores. Yep. Make sure you put the appropriate fluid in. One thing I'll note is if you are put in fluid two or three times irregularly, you really want to get your brake system checked. Either your brakes are very worn sure. and the fluid is, has been used up in the calipers, or you have a leak in your system. Yeah, no, so uh, this uh, should you really shouldn't go down very often. It's really important, too. You notice when you look at the uh, brake fluid reservoir, it's pretty much clear. If you see it's really dark, your car has been or an older car, 100,000, 200,000 miles. You want that change. Is a black, dark brake fluid is not a good thing. No, That's got to be uh, well maintained. You also got another reservoir, Joe. We do. Right next to it's the engine coolant reservoir, uh, and same thing. This has a, a hash line that says uh, where it's where it should be filled or uh, full. Uh, now you'll note on here it says full cold. Very important to understand. You have to check this one. It's cold. And if you have to add it, you do not want to open this cap <laughs> when it is uh, when it's hot because this, this is under 15 pounds of pressure, and you could get scalded. So if you do need to add any fluid, make sure the system is is cool before you add any. Now fluid. we might want to point out that on some vehicles, the uh, if you have a radiator front cover, that uh, tank will be up front. And uh, if you've ever seen it on the side of the road, you see steam flying out of the engine. That's someone who on a hot car open up the radiator cap, and there goes all the there, steam. Yep, yeah, not a very good dangerous. Idea. Yep. Very dangerous. And also, Joe, uh, we might point out that the, the color of this uh, fluid is red. Of course, a lot of antifreeze is green. Yeah, the, the old ethylene glycol uh, antifreeze is green. This is the extended life uh, antifreeze that all new manufacturers use, uh, ecolo ecologically friendly, and make sure that if you do need to add antifreeze, you add the proper antifreeze yeah. for that car. You don't want to confuse that antifreeze area with your windshield was washer mm -hmm. reservoir, which some of it, Joe, is not blue. It's red, too. True. So it's kind of confusing. Now, show us where we would put that stuff. Well, your windshield washer uh, fluid uh, reservoir is right here. On the top, it shows a, <laughs> uh, it shows a windshield with the fluid <laughs> being squirted on, on it. And all you would do if it's low is you pop this top add the appropriate amount of fluid. Now it's kind of tough to see when it's filled, so you'll have to watch the fluid go up to the top. Uh, when you're finished, simply close it and you're all set with that. Okay, the other thing they always ask you when you go to the oil change place, hey, you need an oil filter, or uh, you're, and you got better get a good oil filter. Don't get a non-brand oil filter when you do your oil change. But the other thing they tell you about is an air filter. 
And uh, a lot of people, don't. they'll just say, okay, I need one, go ahead and put one on. But there's a way for you to know if you really need one or not, or see if you're not getting ripped off. How would you check? Well, easy, uh, easy to check an air filter. You'd go over to the box. Uh, in this case, you need no tools. The, uh, the air filter can be uh, inspected just with could be using on whatever side of the car. Look for the clips. It, it could be on the left or right side. Your owner's manual would tell you. At, at most, you might need a screwdriver. But yeah. it, with the case of the Malibu, simply two top clips. these two clips off. Massage this top over to the side a little there bit. There we go. Out of the way. And right here Look at that, folks. is your air cleaner. Boy, Joe, that's a really now good this clean is, air cleaner. This is pretty clean. This has 7,000 miles on it. So it doesn't really need to be changed yet, probably not till 30,000 miles or so. But I think John has uh, some so examples. So if they show you that air filter folders. and you say, let me see it, and if it looks like that, don't get it changed. But if it looks like something like this, there you go. I would say to get a change. There's another rule of thumb if you can't see through, you kind of bend it open. This you can tell has been uh, on the road a long time. It's worth the change. That one, if they show you that, say, no thanks, I'll, I'll wait till my next oil change before I get one. Of course, Joe, they're not all flat like this. Nope, they come in different sizes, different shapes and style. different sizes, another dirty one, square, that, tubes, that you can whatever. See too. You can see through, you can't, you can't put it up against the light, you can see that it's black on the inside, definitely needs a change. It's worth, you know, these are, you can pick them up at a parts store, 15 20 $15, yep. and if you get them changed at the oil place, it's maybe double that. It's uh, two to two and a half times uh, the amount, so you wow. can save yourself a lot of money by simply doing simple. it yourself on a regular basis. If you go to the oil change place and they show you that the filter is dirty, say that's fine put it back put it back in today go I'll, to your I'll oil take, store yeah, and, save do it yourself. and save the money and Joe, uh, not hard to put in very easy to put now i will say that this is the business side in this okay. car this is the business side because this is where the air comes in right don't just take a look at your air filter on the top yep. because this will be the top end will be cleaner and you'll think that it's very clean always take it out look at the bottom end Good. but in this case we're going to replace it with the old one one way and then you just finesse this back into Once place. Once it's set nice and tight, flip it back on, you're set to go. And again, and Joe, you're all done. really good advice about uh, going in. If they tell you you need a dirty one, you don't need to change it. So, All right, Joe, is there anything else now? We've got uh, pretty much the, the high hard ones from the oil change place, but there are other things that will tell you. You know, you need your antifreeze checked, you, uh, and, when, and they say that when was the last time you had your antifreeze or a trans fluid checked. Those are expensive operations. Some are pumped out. They're not really drained. Uh, so those are m some of them 50, 60, 70, $100 or more, or more to, yeah, to get that certainly. kind of service. But there's another thing people always ask about, and that's a serpentine belt. Now, in this car, I notice we don't have a serpentine belt. What well, happened? Well, we do have one, but it's in a real difficult spot to see. If you look down at the alternator way down there, you'll okay. see the serpentine belt. And, and that belt is so important. It's one belt that runs many of the accessories on the engine. And including serpentine, it's like a serpent. It, right. it, it runs your air conditioning compressor, it runs your power steering pump if you have one on your car, it runs your alternator, it could run your water pump. Yep. And so when that belt goes, you lose everything with that motor and you could really damage a motor if the belt goes and you keep on driving the so car. So say you can see your belt and it's pretty easy to get to like on a typical front uh, engine mounted instead of transverse pretty easy way to check is just to turn it over take a look at it push on it maybe well you know let's, you let's turn go. it you know you think I brought one with me John um, you could turn it over here's a uh, typical this, serpentine belt this Joe. is an example of a belt one side it's flat one side it's grooved oh. and I don't know if you can get this in tight but this cracks. this is a good example of a really yes, bad belt that's been taken off thank goodness by the owner and you can wow. see where this will break one of these short days, yeah. and you'll have an owner that, uh, that be wouldn't the guy be very, he'll be on the side of the road. He'll be on the freeway causing that exactly. big backup on I-94 coming home. Exactly. So, again, this is the, in this car, they're really difficult to check. You'd have to have a technician take a look at it, perhaps put it up on a lift. But a lot of on a lot of cars, this belt itself is accessible, and all you want to do is look for, you want to look for any cracks in there, and you want to look for any, like, real high shine, which would mean the belt is starting to slip. Uh, on your, in your owner's manual, it will sometimes tell you that the belt should be changed yep. at particular intervals, typically 60 to 100,000 yeah. miles. And folks, uh, sometimes it takes special tools. Each car is made a little bit different. The dealership is the best place for that. Uh, they have the right tool. They've done it before. Not something you want to tap for yourself. Joe, we only got a couple more minutes. Any yeah. other yeah. last high hard ones we got to couple, hit? A couple of last minute things. Um, as you're doing this on occasion, uh, you want to lubricate the oh, secondary, yeah. Oh, yeah. secondary the latches. latches, make sure that, it, that it'll continue mm -hmm. working, especially yep. in cold weather. I also recommend that you do a walkthrough around your car and from the front side and back that you look, you go down and look under your car, you're going to look for loose air dams, loose shields, exhaust shields, perhaps a, a loose uh, exhaust system itself just to make sure that nothing's hanging down. 
bad enough it falls off your car, but worse if you're the guy behind the, behind it. So, it's, it, so Joe, it's not just all visual, folks. Uh, sometimes you need to turn the radio down, hang up the phone, listen to your car. If you hear a rattling noise, you can kind of, kind of locate that noise and do that walk around, Joe. It'll, yep. it'll help you out. Absolutely. And one last thing I'd say, if you have children, you know, 10, 12, 14 years old, get them involved in doing this. Bring them out, show them what you do, little by little, show them how to do it. Get them involved to the point where that when they when they start driving, they're going to know they have a responsibility to keep and maintain their car, the car up to. And by then, they'll they'll know exactly how to do these regular inspections. So. All kinds of great advice, Joe. Uh, again, thank you so much for coming by. My pleasure, folks. John. This is really good information. You got to remember it and uh, make sure that you check in on your your owner's manual. Take a minute to read it, and uh, you'll get more automotive information on cars and context in the coming time. Joe, again, thanks. We'll go back inside the studio. Now, welcome back to Cars in Context. I'm your host, John Clore. Well, we had a really good walk around under the hood there, Joe, with uh, Joe Babby. It was a great job out there. Yeah, my pleasure, I, th I think uh, your last comment there at the end of it, really to take younger people through, you know, showing them the, the ropes underneath the hood is a good idea. I remember That's my big idea. brother, my big brother Jerry. Jerry, if you're out there watching, thank you. Uh, you know, we changed our own oil at home back in the days. We didn't go to, we didn't have quickie lubes. And we did, and I learned about, you know, my way under the hood with my brother. And I know now if you've, uh, if you've got a young person, and especially if they're beginning to drive and they're going off on their own, it's not a bad thing Absolutely. to teach them what's going on under the hood. Joe, a lot of good information. Thanks again. I really appreciate it. My that. pleasure. Anytime. Okay, buddy. Now it's time for Pride in My Ride, one of my favorite segments. So, Joe, what do we have today for Pride in My Ride? Today we have a really interesting story. There's a gentleman, uh, John Resmussen. I consider him a friend of mine. Lives okay. in Clarkston, Michigan. And uh, John is 81 years old. And he owns a 1917 Model T there it is. that oh. he bought in 1969, and it is an unrestored Model T. Now, here is a 95-year-old car where it's all original, including the interior and the paint, except for some minor touch-up, the original engine. Uh, it's been rebuilt and it's been updated well, for yeah, safety he, reasons. Yeah, he but needs other new than tires that, the, and he'll need the ignition, right? I the mean, parts you see on that were assembled in the factory 95 years ago. And by the way, that photo is of John in front of the Highland Park assembly plant oh, okay. where that Model T was produced <laughs> in 1970. So it's back to its birthplace. Back, it did go back to its birthplace. I yep. notice he's got rust on it. He doesn't care about how that looks. Oh, no, not at all. That's a patina. That's what, you know, you can only make a car original once or yep. have a car original once. So that once car is as original and, as he And he does it. not want to restore it, and I'm really glad that he doesn't want to restore it. Uh, the, the, this 1970 Model T is one of about 800,000 built or produced in uh, 1917. 800,000? 834,000 in that model year. Oh. And originally it cost $360 new. In 1969, John paid $930 for that car. Oh. Interestingly, you would think maybe he negotiated that from 1,000 to 900, and they met somewhere at 930. Yeah, 930 is an odd number. Yeah, but well, the, uh, he asked the guy what he wanted for it, and the guy said, I need $930 because I need to buy a snowmobile, and that's what the snowmobile cost. <laughs> and that's how they came out with the $900 and, uh, $930 for the car. So he's owned it for 40-some-odd years. Did it run when he bought it? Uh, yeah, I believe it did run, but it needed you know, complete going over, you know, just the, the tune-up and mechanical things to make sure it is safe. The only thing he's changed on it, he's added a secondary transmission from a Model TT oh, okay. truck. Yep. Which gives it basically overdrive and, and, t and brings the top speed up, although he keeps he limits top speed to about 35 miles an hour because wow. it doesn't stop very well. I mean, the Model T's did not do <laughs> You're not going to see well. this on 696 right. doing 35. Right. And so it's just a great car. He loves driving. He loves showing the car. I, I really enjoyed, uh, uh, you know, doing the, you know, some uh, photographing the car and, and spending time with John. Interestingly, at 81, a uh, short time ago, he bought a 1969 Corvette that he is right now oh. doing a frame-off restoration on. I've just recently seen, uh, seen his photos of the chassis and engine, and he's doing a, a top-notch job. This guy is 81, but you'd swear he's 35. He's got so much energy, love loves it. old cars. He's a, a pleasure to be with and hang out with. Uh, just a, a great story. Well, great guy and a great story. Well, thanks for that submission, folks. If you want to be on Pride in My Ride, just send us a JPEG photo. High digital quality be, would be great. To jclore at carsandcontext.com and give us your name, your hometown, and why you have Pride in Your Ride. Now, if you want to see more on this car, you can go to fordracing.com and check out Joe's story about this very car and the visit back to its birthplace you know, back in Highland Park. We appreciate that. So, but you know, Joe, uh, one other thing about these Pride in My Rides, I really like the fact that you're bringing in cars that not are all fancy restored cars. These are cars that people really love and, and drive every day. Thanks for that. I appreciate it much. Now, folks, 
you wouldn't believe it, but all, it's, we're running out of time. But we also have something else coming out. I think there's one more thing happening. We do have some viewer mail today. Lauren, do we have viewer mail coming in from our viewers out there in Cars and Contacts land? Yes, oh, we, we do. do. We and do. Lauren Parrott. Oh, my gosh. Joe, we Hot got viewer mail. Thank you very much, Lauren. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> folks, we've got viewer mail again. We appreciate you sending in your cards and letters and calling the War Memorial. Here's the first one. This comes from Rick G. Uh, he's out in Gross Point Shores. He watches WMTV on Comcast table uh, channel 915. That means he's watching in HD. Thanks for this, Rick. Rick, here's the question. Uh, I saw your other show when you and your guests talked about the real reason that oil prices and the cost of gasoline is so high. I'd like my friends to see the show, but I forgot to record that episode on my DVR. John, can you tell me if WMTV is planning to repeat that program? I cannot tell you that, uh, Rick, but you know you can call the War Memorial, call Lauren, and she can make you a copy of that show for your, uh, for your friends. It's 313-881-7511. Or you can, um, for your own copy of the DVD, or just... Um, uh, go to uh, thevirtualdriver.com and download it off their segment as well. Joel, do you have a question for us as well? I do. This comes from Tyler C. of Gross Point Woods, who watches WMTV on ATTUverse Channel 99. Uh, hi, Joe. Uh, enjoyed watching you on a, uh, in a heartbeat show when you gave the history of the old Packard plant on Detroit's east side. But I was wondering if you knew why the huge facility was left to decay for decades instead of somebody repurposing the property. Um, like they do for some other closed down factories. It seems such a shame that the whole place was never able to make something else yeah. and save the community. Yeah, and you're right, the community is, uh, has uh, gone down just like the plant did. But the problem was that by the 50s when the plant closed, it was antiquated. Yep. Most factories became one story factories, auto plants at that time, and could not be used as an automobile plant. Subsequently, uh, a few other small companies went in, leased a little bit of the space. Yeah. But then there was an issue with tax problems. And yeah, the, the whole and guy, the owner, the owner took off. And then off. they lost the owner. They didn't know who uh, owned the building. The city owned it. Then somebody else bought it back on a, a tax sale. And now uh, it's just in the state of ruin, although they are starting to tear the remainder of the building down. All these so years. It's, it's, it's sad. It has a rich history, but it's sad to see it the way it is. It is. That's a great question. If you have a question for us here at Cars and Context, just send it in to Clor at carsandcontext.com, or you can always call the War Memorial at 313-881-7511. We'd be happy to answer them on the air. Joe, again, thanks for coming by today. It's all the My time we have today. Great to see we'll you We'll have again. you back again, and if uh, you guys want that uh, hard-to-answer automotive question, make sure you tune in next time. I'm your host, John Clore. Thanks for joining us.